Hello and welcome back to Sociology 101. I had a little time this afternoon and thought I would jump on and reply to a debate I actually listened to years ago in preparation for my debate with James White, but it was just brought up again on Twitter. I'd totally forgotten about it, in fact. And um, many of you know I'm on this diet where I'm having to get so many steps in every day, and so I'm listening to a lot more stuff when I walk. It helps if I listen to things I'm interested in. And so I saw that on Twitter, referenced this debate between Steve, Stephen Gregg and James White, and um, and specifically like later in the debate, because oftentimes it's like has eight parts to it, and oftentimes you you end up watching one or two or three parts, and you don't ever get to the the end of this long long discussion. And sometimes the best meat in a discussion is is maybe at the end. And that happened to be the case, I think, with this particular discussion, uh, especially as it gets into Romans chapter 1, uh, 2, and 3. And you'll hear how Steve Gregg takes a very similar approach to what you've heard me take on this program. But I wanted you to hear James White kind of engage when he's really being pressed on this. Uh, before we jump into that, let me remind you, if you want to help support this ministry, it's a, a listener-supported ministry, you can click on that support link there in the show notes or uh, go to sociology101.com and click on that support link. If you're interested in get a higher theological education, consider trinitysem.edu. Trinity Seminary is where I'm a, a professor of theology, and so if you would like to uh, join us there, we would uh, welcome you with open arms. Uh, I, I saw Idol Killer there, Warren, commenting on the side chat and uh, just messaged him and said, hey, buddy, you want to jump on? You're welcome to in this discussion. <laughs> and he, he wasn't, unfortunately, wasn't able to. He's got his kids with him and everything. He's got a, other plans today, which I, you know, short notice thing, I didn't expect it. But I, I still hope to see a debate between him and James White. Maybe we'll see that uh, because I, I think, uh, just like with Steve Gregg, I, I think that um, uh, Warren would do a really good job and hold his own in debating over, especially over the doctrine of total depravity and what, what that entails. So, um, yeah, <laughs> that's going to be about my shirt. I have a blue, brown, gray. I mean, the, the Texas Baptist shirts, I have like six different ones in here, and I hang them in my studio because when I come in and I have the colored shirts that don't look good on screen, I just take them off, and I, I had a black, plain black shirt on, so I put this one on. Anyway, that, that's why you'll maybe see some of the same shirts that I, I wear like time and time again when I do my broadcast. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, one is saying he they joined with me on the health or wager link that I put on there, and already down seven pounds. Yeah, if you're needing the motivation uh, to to stay on your diet, I, every time I see a cookie or anything that that uh, would weigh me down, it I think dollar signs. It's going to cost me money. <laughs> so for me, that's an all I need. I don't like paying money to lose weight, and man, that that motivates me all that I need. So I'm glad that's helping you out. It's not for everybody. It wouldn't work for my wife, but it it, it definitely works for me. So I appreciate that. Um, and I'm, I'm, down, I'm down about 17 pounds as of this morning. So uh, I'm, I'm losing it pretty quick. The first, the first 20, 30 pounds is easy for me as a big guy. Um, it's, it's when you get down to that last 15 pounds, it becomes really, really hard to, to, kind, of, to kind of do that. So that's going to be fun. But um, I, I wanted to play this, this broadcast between James White and Steve Gregg, where Gregg is really pressing him on his interpretation of Romans chapter 1. Now, before you listen to this, I, I will admit that it sounds like that that Greg is really kind of interrupting James a little too much. Maybe he should let James finish and talk. But you've got to understand, you've got to listen to the whole debate leading up to this point to really get how this interaction has gone. They're, they're supposed to get a full 12 minutes to just talk and not have any interruptions, just talk. Um, but you can choose to, instead of just using that whole time to talk, you can choose to ask your opponent some questions. But obviously, you don't want them to just go on a long diatribe and you know take up all your time. You want to kind of keep it short, just so like, yes or no, is this, is this the case? And some questions, I, I agree, can't be just answered yes or no. You kind of need to unpack them. And so you will see a little heat come up here in this portion of the discussion because Steve is trying to move him along and not and not to take up too much of his time and point out what he believes is his exegetical issues with Romans chapter 1. And so this is one of the reasons you'll see kind of the tension between the two. And what you'll see is James White get upset and just kind of take his ball and go home like he didn't want to talk anymore. So you'll just hear him go silent like, oh, you talking to me? I, I'm not even in this debate anymore kind of a thing. And it, it's kind of funny because Steve just keeps his cool and keeps pressing, uh, rolling right along. And, and the reason I want... Um, to do this and to show you this is because I think Steve Gregg is just pinpointing and pushing 
on the fatal flaw of Calvinistic theology, which is total depravity, this concept that we're born unable to respond positively to the things of God. Um, and we're just born that way, that we just are born truth suppressors, uh, in Romans 1, as, as they take the, that out of context to mean. And, and, and Greg is just doing a really good job here, I think, of just pushing on that point really, really hard to help people to see uh, that problem. And so there's a, yeah, Derek, uh, Derek, maybe you, you might have been the one who mentioned this, uh, in fact, on Twitter where I got it from you. Um, and, and Derek is saying as soon as he was cornered, he kind of lashed out. <laughs> it was just, but Greg just kind of keeps his cool and just keeps kind of really nicely mo moving along uh, and does a, does a good job. Derek, I do think it was you on Twitter that, that, that posted that. Um, and so, yeah, it, 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 it's a good one. So you, let's, just, let's just dive in and listen to it. Hopefully the audio sounds good. Okay, it's an old video, but I tried to doctor it up just a little bit. And um, hopefully let me know if the sound is bad. Um, let's look at Romans chapter 1, because I want to nail down exactly what the exegetical basis is for the doctrine of uh, total depravity. Uh, and I'd just like to ask you some questions, and uh, these are really answer these are questions that don't need long answers. They just, most of them are yes or no type questions, and uh, I have a lot of questions, so I'd kind of like to move through them as rapidly as we can, though I don't want to give you inadequate time to answer any of the questions. But Romans chapter 1 uh, verses 18 through 32 is pretty much a classic proof text for total depravity. It talks about how wicked uh, people are and how they've been given over by God and so forth. Uh, I'd just like to ask you some questions. Is this passage in your judgment about Gentiles? It's actually about, uh, I think, all of mankind. Uh, it can be applied solely to Gentiles. The Jews certainly take that to viewpoint in Romans chapter 2. That's why in Romans chapter 3, Paul basically goes back and says, No, actually, though you thought I was talking only about Jews, uh, I'm also talking about you. And he wraps okay. everybody up in verses 10 through 18 in that. Okay, subject. so you're saying, that, you're saying that this passage is about all mankind? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, are you isogeting there? Where's the word all? <laughs> uh, well, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. That is the uh, that is no, no. That doesn't on. stop there. It does not stop there. It says all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in yeah. their unrighteousness. So, mic drop right there. That's that's bam. That's it. <laughs> that's it. That that should be it. Um, look at the passage. Look what what uh, Greg is rightly pointing out here. Um, I want to put it up on the screen so that you can actually see this here uh, because we can talk about it all day long, but it, unless you see it for the, yourself on the screen, sometimes it's it's a difficult to follow. Um, notice oftentimes it starts with verse 18 when people want to you know prove total inability from birth. They want to start with verse 18 because that fits their narrative. But remember, it really starts back more closer to 15, 16 when he talks here and it really this right this little section right here wasn't in the original text this this chapter divide there's no chapter divide um the word four there is showing that he's ref, he's reflecting on what he's just been talking about so he's, there's no breaks here there's obviously no verse divides or chapter divides in the original text so he's saying i'm not ashamed of the gospel it's the power of god for salvation for everyone who believes so he's talking about both jew gentile Anyone who believes is the power of God and salvation first to the Jew and then also to the Greek. So both are included in that inclusive aspect of it. For the righteousness of God is revealed, uh, it says from, or it could also be by faith, um, by faith to those with faith. In other words, by, from faith to faith is like saying from the faithful ones to the next generation of faith, from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Okay, so who are the righteous people? Who? Why does God call Job a righteous man? Because he was perfect? He kept the law perfectly? He just lived a perfect, sinless life? No, of course not. Um, why did he call Noah a righteous man? Because he was perfect? He never did anything wrong? No. Why was he righteous? Because he believed in the righteous one. Okay, so he was called righteous not by works because all have fallen short, but he is called righteous what? Because he believes. Okay, so the righteous live by faith. Well, who would be contrasted with the righteous who live by faith? Um, maybe those who suppress the truth in unrighteousness? In other words, believers versus unbelievers, regardless of whether they're Jew or Gentile. So I, I've just talked about the Jew and the Gentile who believe, and now I'm going to talk about the Jew and the Gentile who don't believe. Okay, And notice that that's what Greg 
just kind of busts him uh, on right here. It says, that's not what it says, White. It doesn't say everyone suppresses the truth and unrighteousness. It says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. But he just contrasted that with the righteous man who doesn't suppress the truth and unrighteousness, but who lives by faith in the very verse that you just went from. And so this is so paramount to understanding how people do eisegesis without I mean, just get away with it. And you'll hear Greg call him on this throughout this discussion. So just keep listening. It, it, it gets even better. It says that God is angry at all men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. If I were to say, I am angry at all judges who legislate from the bench, that doesn't mean I'm angry at all judges. It just means I'm angry at all the ones who legislate from the bench. So True. Paul tells us, that God is angry at all men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. I'm wondering where it says he's angry at all men, or that all, all men suppress all, the truth. Yeah, yeah, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, of course, but that's not in this passage. I'm, we're, we're not, ex, you know, yeah, you're I, I going it, several chapters off. I, I, okay, so notice how he's conflating this concept of everybody sins. Okay, well, so did Noah. So did Job. And they called, they're called righteous. So did all these people in verse 17 right here, Dr. White, that said the righteous man lived by faith. All of those people sin too. That's not the point. <laughs> the point is, is that he's contrasting the sinners who live by faith and are declared righteous by God's grace versus those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness and the wrath of God being revealed on those people. That, that's the point. I, I get a little uh, boisterous sometimes when I, when I want people to see something that seems so blatantly obvious to me, and it's, and it's in black and white right there. Um, and, and, and Greg is masterfully pointing it out but just you, you, it almost like that he's talking to someone with blinders on. He d doesn't even follow what Greg is trying to say. And, and hopefully my audience is insightful and objective enough to see exactly what Greg is, is saying here. He's saying the exact right thing that needs to be said to someone who, who is not reading the context of, of the quote. It's, uh, it's uh, really one of the clearest givens we can possibly have. Is, okay, so uh, in other words, it doesn't say okay, in this I'll passage that I'll God is what. angry at all men. Okay, so notice he's interrupting him there, and I know that sounds like he's being rude, but remember, this is his time, okay? He's giving his 12 minutes where he could just give a big old long speech uninterrupted like White just got through doing. Or he can use it to ask some clarifying questions, to push him on some things. And so in letting, instead of just letting James just eat up his time, he's cutting him in, cutting him off to say, no, okay, so what you're saying is this. Let's move along. Okay, let's, let's move along here. And so that, that's the point. So uh, it's at the 212. Let me back it up just a little bit. And you can hear that again. Really one of the clearest givens we can possibly have. Is okay, so in other words, it doesn't say okay, in this I'll passage what, I'll, that I'll God is what, angry at all men. I'll, I'll tell you what. Why don't you have your time because you're not going to let me get a word in edgewise anyway. No, so no I want to do your time and then I'll do James, it. all I need are short answers, yes or no, because no, these are easy no, questions. No, no, these, these are These are loaded questions that do of not allow for a meaning. Of course they are, course they are and so are yours. So we're gonna, James. We're going to go in. Okay, James. Time. James, please. Let's be fair. The questions you asked me are loaded also. These are questions that are not unfair questions. They're exegetical questions. The question is, no, is sir. there anything that can be exegeted from this passage that tells us that Paul is talking about all men? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, there is. Okay, what is it in this passage that tells us that? Okay, uh, well, I started going there, and, and you interrupted me. But uh, it says, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Who is the them? Is God's... The, the who is the them? Uh, those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. <laughs> that's who the them are, um, and and so that that's what Greg is trying to get you to to point out. And it's ironic. Watch through this. Is that how you remember how James White would accuse David Palman and I and others of, of if we went on to verse forty five when we were talking about John chapter six verse forty four? If we went on to forty five to give clarity to what he meant by 44, that we were reading the text backwards. And you will hear James throughout this pro program referring to Romans chapter 3 and quote-unquote reading it backwards to explain why he's saying what he says with regard to Romans chapter 1. And, and Greg calls him out on that. General revelation limited only to sinful men, or do all men receive that knowledge? But that's not, men, that's not relevant to my question, James, because we could, okay. say, we could say the general Paul. revelation is available to all men, but that's not what Paul's saying. Paul's saying those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness have had the advantage of his revelation. That's true of them. It may be true of others, too, but Paul hasn't raised the question of anyone else. 
He's uh, saying that these people have received revelation from God, and all they have suppressed have, yeah. it. And they have suppressed it. Well, yes, okay, I would agree with you that all men have. I'm not denying that. But Paul hasn't said anything about all men. He's talking about certain men. Certain men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. These people, what is known of God, has been made known to them. Now, there is nothing in the passage that tells us that Paul is talking about anyone other than these men that he's mentioned in verse 18. Now, it also says that they, in, in verse 20 and 21, these people say they knew God, okay, but they didn't want to glorify him as God, so they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. At what point in time does an unbeliever's heart become darkened? Okay, so notice the great question here. Now, White's kind of having a hissy fit, and he's kind of sitting back and not listening at this. He's not talking back because he's upset because he got cut off, and so he's not responding here. But I, I don't want that drama to distract you from Greg's awesome question because what's he asking? Let's, let's look at the text again because I want you to see this. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became, he's pointing out, notice they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Okay, goes on to talk about they traded the truth in for lies. Um, therefore, therefore, God gave them over to the lust of their hearts and purity so that the bodies would be dishonored among them. They exchanged, there it is, verse 25, they exchanged the truth. You can't exchange something unless you have it first. So they had the truth, they knew the truth, but they exchanged it for a lie. Um, and they, for this reason, they're given over to their degrading passions. And so what, Greg is pointing out all these things. So when do they become darkened? Are they born that way by, from birth, which is what your system teaches? Or is this something they become because of their desire, because of their choice to trade the truth in for lies? And, and Greg is rightly pointing out that, that that's the problem here with uh, White's uh, interpretation. Listen. I'm sorry, you're talking to me? Yeah, you're, you're the guy I'm talking to. Yeah, okay. that's right. All right. Well, I told you that I'm asking I, you questions. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, you've you've got a few a few questions, but like I, I was trying to say to Paul, but I couldn't get a word in edwise edwise there. I I don't think that uh, this kind of interaction is is overly meaningful, but when people can't hear what we're talking about, so I really think that you should allow uh, full time to him, and you can even take the time away from me, and then we can if we want to discuss Romans chapter one. Okay, okay Doctor White, I will tell you what. I will. I'll I'll, I'll take the whole I, time. I won't ask you to answer any more questions. But I will say this, what I'm trying to do is to get you to talk about some specific passages rather than rattle them off. But don't, don't say anything because you don't want to interact. But let me, let me just say this. No, I would like to interact. I just don't believe that oh. you're allowing interaction. I'm asking for some straight answers. No, you're, you, know, you, you said that the questions I asked you were loaded questions. Yes. I asked you specific questions about the grammar of the text that you have made false statements about in public. Okay, you well, I'm asking you a similar question. You have publicly said... That Romans 1 is about all men. I'm saying, where in the text does it say that? Okay, the entire argument that the Apostle is presenting to lay the foundation for the necessity of justification by faith and the need of a Savior to bear sins for Jews and Gentiles is found in Romans 1, 2, okay, and 3. Okay, I'll accept that. And I'll accept that answer. I'll accept that answer, okay? In other words, because of your understanding of the paradigm of, of Romans and the argument there, you read into Romans 1 things that are not said there. And that's fine. That is, I, that is that, possible see, to do sometimes. See, I, reject, I reject that. This is not interaction. That's not cross-examination. Okay. That's exactly what White's doing. He's taking what is said in chapter uh, 3, which is the concluding statements that all are under sin, and he's reading it back into Romans chapter 1, where Paul is building a case with regard to the fact that the Jews are just as guilty as the Gentiles, um, and that all, yes, we're not, in, in, Greg will go on and explain this. No, no, he, nobody's trying to say that, uh, that some people are sinners and some people aren't sinners, okay? He, he's, he's drawing the distinction that we've already pointed out in the text, that the righteous live by faith, but there are people who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, and those people become hardened and defiled, and God pours out his wrath. He demonstrates his wrath on these kinds of people, whether Jew or Gentile. 
And there are people among the Jews and the Gentiles, which would have been a, a shock to hear that for the Gentiles at that time. They didn't think that they were in that group. That's just the Gentiles who are the, the ones getting the wrath of God over there in that group. And Paul's going, no, it's it's both. <laughs> both both groups, whether Jew or Gentile, if you're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, if you're not believing the revelation that you've been given, then this is the wrath that's being poured out on you. You will be grow darkened. Uh, you will become defiled in your thinking. You will grow hardened. That's true across the board. And and w- Greg is trying to kind of push through the weeds of what White is saying and helping people to see that's the context of Romans chapter one. Um, and White doesn't it doesn't seem like he wants to engage with that that problem, at least to me, at least. Examination is asking questions, not making comments at the end that are unsubstantiated by what I just That's said. That's not true, Doc. Okay. If, if you had listened to the first f- four hours of the debate, like the first four sections, this would make you really laugh because White does this kind of thing over and over. I've heard him do it to me over and over. How many times, he, it's not about making comments after the person gives their rebuttal. How many times has White made comments after I said something? Uh, I just played one the other day where I say that, you know, we should humble ourselves like a child. Uh, and like Jesus brought up a child, we should humble ourselves like a child. That's our responsibility. And then, and, and then his immediate rebuttal is, I heard somebody say that children are humble. Uh, which I was, I was quoting Jesus. Jesus is the one that said that, and he's he, he mocks that. Um, that that's what's he doing? He's commenting on a thing I just got through saying. Exactly what what Greg is doing. Greg has every right to comment and give rebuttal to what White says because White does it all the time to us. It's a part of what exchange and debate looks like. Um, and why why he's acting as if that's just not appropriate. You just can't do that. I, I don't I don't know. White, that is not true. You make comments about questions that I answer too. You see, we have to have we have to have a fair exchange where I get to answer some questions and I get to ask some questions too. Uh, I think maybe you're just accustomed to dominating the, the no, discussion. No, you just you just you just said that I I suggested something into the text. Yes, you, you said that this that, is about all men. It does not say end. that anywhere. You just made that at the end, and I have argued to you that to take it the way that you are taking it and to say this is only about a certain group of men and that there are people who have had knowledge of God, but and they have thanked him without uh, having been redeemed, or, or some kind of, of, of entire concept unknown to the entire Book of Romans. And to let you get away with that, that somehow is me reading okay. something into the Okay, Dr. White, I, let's, uh, let's drop this point, because I think our listeners have seen uh, what you've said and what I've said, and we'll let them use their own reasoning powers about this. Uh, the truth of the matter... Yes, uh, the listeners have heard both sides. And uh, we've looked at the text, and we can see that he's obviously contrasting the righteous who live by faith with those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. That's not my words. That's a quote from Paul himself. The fact that Greg has to continually over and over barrage somebody to get them just to admit what the text actually says, it never says anything about God revealing his wrath against every single human being because of their nature from birth, which is the very way in which Calvinists read Romans 1. We've been over it a hundred times. We've played Al Mohler doing it. We've played John Piper doing it. We've played R.C. Sproul doing it. All of the Calvinists do it exactly the same way, where they'll take it from verse 18 on, and they'll say this is a universal condition of everyone from birth. And Greg is doing the right thing. He's a biblicist, and he's saying, okay, maybe that's true, but does that say that here? So, what, what, what Greg wants to do, he's a really good debater. If you haven't heard, a lot better than I'll ever hope to be, by the way. And I'm not just saying that to be modest. Greg is just a really, really good debater. Um, somebody wanted me to debate Steve Gregg on eternal security. I was like, no, thank you. No, no thank you. I don't want to debate Steve Gregg on anything. Um, he's a really good debater, good thinker. Um, and and uh, so G- Greg, is, is what he's trying to do is to take White down a path to say, okay, if it doesn't say it right here, Okay, then let's go where it does say it. And then I'll take him to that passage and say, okay, where does it say it here? And then he'll be able to rebut the next passage that he wants to go to, uh, which is, is which a good debater does. Let's let's go instead of just spitfiring all these passages out, let's let's actually go to the passage that you're saying says this and let's look at it for a while first. And then once you can admit that it doesn't really say that, and then you can say, Okay, but you're getting that from another text, maybe a couple chapters down. Okay, well now we can go over there. And then we can deal with it. And that's what Greg is trying to get him to do. But 
there's too much tension here and drama here for, for Greg to be able to, and this happens a lot in debate, by the way, I, I have my plan in my mind as to where I want to take my opponent by, by taking them down this trail of saying, okay, see here, this is not true. Now let's go to point number two. And oftentimes you don't even get to point number two or three or four in your mind because the debater gets angry or contends with every little thing you say or nuances every little word you're trying to say or brings in a whole nother context about like the universal sinfulness of man, like White does here, as if Greg doesn't believe in the universal sinfulness of man. That's not the point of contention that he's bringing up. And so you that's one of the reasons that debates are sometimes not all that helpful because you're you're limited so much into your time restraints and you can't just really unpack it all and it, it does get frustrating at times. There is, and you don't have to answer any more, Dr. White, until it's your turn, which will be just a couple of minutes actually. But uh, what seems clear is that there's nothing in Romans 1 that says that Paul is talking about all men. What he says might in fact be true of all men. We don't know, but Paul doesn't tell us that it is. And therefore, it, we have to bring that idea in. Now, I asked Dr. White at what point in a person's, in an unbeliever's life, their hearts are darkened. Paul talks about these people as people who once knew God, but their hearts have become darkened. Why? Because they suppress the truth. I would think that Dr. White's view is that all unbelievers are born with their hearts darkened. He describes them as dead in sins and uh, darkened in their hearts and their imaginations and so forth. I don't find anywhere in the Bible that states that this is the birth condition of every man. I exactly. And, and that, that's one of the reasons I wanted to play this, because one, and notice it says Calvinism versus Arminianism at the top of the screen here. Um, I don't think an Arminian would agree with Steve Gregg on that point, at least the classical Arminians that I've been tweeting. Uh, uh, Derek, if you're in the side chat, you would know what I'm talking about. Nathan will know what I'm talking about. Um, I've been going back and forth with uh, Dr. Abishano and some others on Twitter about the the total inability uh, issue and we may be having a discussion soon about that hopefully we will I, I, I would welcome the discussion but notice what steve Gregg is doing here he's defending provisionism <laughs> in the way we defend it he's saying total inability is certainly not being taught here now maybe may and he's being he's being gracious by saying now maybe it's somewhere else but it's not here and so he, he's saying that not to try to suggest that it is somewhere else He's trying to show that, well, it's not right here. And so that, that kind of gives your your opponent a, a, an out to go, okay, well, let's go over here then. Let's go look over. Since we can't find it right here where we where we said it was, let's go somewhere else where we said it was, and let's contend with that point. And, um, and so Greg is just kind of masterfully picking apart James's argument to show, no, these people became darkened. No, these people were given over after having the truth, after knowing who God was, they traded the truth in for lies, and therefore this is a condition of people who have actively suppressed truth, not the condition of everyone from birth. And and you can't just assume that's what Paul meant. You've got to actually show us in the Scripture where Paul says that in order for us to come to that conclusion. That And that's what Steve Gregg is, is asking for. I do see Paul saying that there are certainly many men, and he's talking about them right here who have known the truth, and they've rejected the truth, and as a result, darkness has come upon their hearts. I believe this is true in virtually all the passages that talk about uh, total depravity, at least that are used. Uh, the reason I wanted to ask some specific questions about a passage, and in my opinion, the reason Dr. White didn't want me to do so, is because it does not allow the Calvinist to simply rattle off passages and say, see there. For example, when Dr. White gave his original argument, he talked about the state of the antediluvian people, that the thoughts and imaginations of their heart were only evil continually. He talked about the leopard can't change its spots and the Ethiopian can't change its skin, so cannot you who are accustomed to evil do good. He talked about the heart being desperately wicked and, and uh, deceitful above all things. He used a lot of scriptures, which the Bible directs towards certain audiences and says this is true of them. But if we look at the context of each of these, we find that it's a specific group of people if we want to exegete yes. the passage, we can't go to Genesis 6 or, Rev, or Jeremiah or these passages and find a place where it is saying all human beings fit this category. Jeremiah is addressing the Jews of his day who were that way. Now, of course, I'm not arguing that there aren't many others who are that way. And that's what uh, Dr. White's answer about Romans 1 was getting at. He's suggesting that I think that no one else would find this applicable to them. I'm not questioning how many people besides this would be applicable to. I'm questioning what the passage is actually teaching. I believe the passage is teaching what it says. There are people who have known God. There are people who did not like to know God. They've suppressed the truth in their unrighteousness. 
And as a result, they become darkened, and God is angry at them because they suppress the truth. Isn't that simple? <laughs> he says it. This is one of the reasons he's a better debater than I am. He says things a lot more concisely than I have the ability to do. I ramble on with stories and stuff. I got to get better at doing what Steve just did. He just takes them through just so simply, and I want to get better at that. Um, and and he, he masterfully points out, okay, you, you want to look at Genesis 6? Well, look at who he's talking about. He's talking about the people of that day. He never says everybody's like this from birth. He even, he even points out that, well, there's Noah and his family. They found favor in the eyes of God. Okay, so that excludes everybody then from that conclusion, but then you'd have to impose upon the text, well, because Noah was elect and irresistibly graced or effectually graced, that's why he's that way. A Calvinist would have to impose that into the meaning of Genesis chapter 6, and then you would have to ask the question, well, why didn't? Why does God express frustration and anger? Then why doesn't he just do that same thing he does to Noah and his family? Why doesn't he just do that for more people there at that time? That doesn't make any sense. In fact, it's it's interesting. I was listening to a podcast from a couple of Calvinists uh, up in Oklahoma City. Um, I can't remember the name of the podcast. This was Sam Storms and those guys. And one of the, uh, the podcasters who's been on my program before um, actually asked that very question. He, he asked Sam Storms, why didn't God just elect more of them instead of expressing frustration and kind of angst? Why didn't he just elect more of them and regenerate more of them? And Sam Storm kind of well, we don't know why God does what he does. He, he's his choice. It's his prerogative and kind of moves on. But but that's the kinds of issues that you raise. And then you got the, you know, the, the leopard can't change his spots. And, and it, you notice how Steve pointed out. So are the ones who are accustomed to doing evil. So he's talking about who? The people who at that day are accustomed to doing evil. They, they, they can't do good any more so than a leopard can change his spots. Why? Because they're accustomed to doing evil. Okay. So why are you applying that to the natural condition of every man from birth? Because the, the passage certainly doesn't say that. Why are you? And that's what Steve's looking for. Where is the passage of Scripture that teaches this is the natural condition of everyone from birth? Not that they become darkened and grow callous, like the Scripture actually says, but that they're born in a condition that looks exactly like that. Where does the passage say this? Where does the Scripture say this? You can't just rattle off all these texts and do the, do the old, um, you know, this, this thing right here that we looked at last time where you just grab all this little proof text that used to go all the go in the white cups and act as if they really fit in the red cup. No, <laughs> they don't fit there. Uh, it, it just does not work, uh, no matter how much you try to make them fit. Now, I'm going to go ahead and I wanted to talk about quite a few passages. If we'd gotten shorter answers to some of these things, we might have covered more ground. But uh, <laughs> I really need to give Dr. White the microphone because we're going to run out of time here. Yeah, we, we, uh, if we give him 12 minutes, uh, we're going to run near the end. So let's go ahead and turn it over. Thank you, Dr. White. All right, thank you. So notice, just pointing out the fairness of this, Steve Gregg used his 12 minutes instead of just giving a long rant like you're about to hear White give. Steve stopped and asked his opponent questions. The fact that he's interrupting him and stopping him, cutting him short, is not a rudeness thing. He's trying to manage the little amount of time that he has to be able to get to the next point. And so Steve wasn't being rude here. He was actually being very gracious to give that much time to his opponent during his 12-minute spiel. And now James White's going to take his full 12 minutes just to, again, shotgun with a bunch of other text and his conclusions about them and never allow Steve any kind of rebuttal time or any kind of, uh, you know, he didn't ask Steve any questions, in other words, which is his prerogative. You can do what you want to during your 12 minutes. But um, I'm just pointing that out because some people, you know, hear a dialogue like that and think, well, Steve's just not being fair. Well, no, he's actually being more fair uh, by giving his opponent his own time to talk. Hey, Steve, Dr. White, the next 12 minutes are yours. Uh, if I had given shorter answers. Oh, okay. Well, I, I, I'm sorry that this, uh, this has developed. Um, I really think that these are issues uh, that require a very high level of, uh, of discussion, and I, I don't think that that kind of interaction... Uh, with questions that are that uh, you know, I'm sorry, but when you when you have to throw in little taglines at the end, those are those are not questions that are meant to get us to the truth. And when you throw little taglines at the end, if you just go listen to this whole five five or eight part whatever it is debate, and listen to how many times White does exactly like, exactly that after Steve Craig makes a comment, well he'll throw a little tagline in or he'll say something derogatory about what was just said. Uh, how, how many times he's done that with me or any other debate I've ever watched James White do. So sometimes there's double standards there when it comes to that. That's just that's just a part of the debate. And I 
think that the vast majority of our listeners will recognize that if you look at Romans chapter 1 and you look at the vice list, the list of sins uh, listed by the Apostle Paul, they seem, beginning 28 and following, to be very much the very same sins that Paul lists elsewhere as the very things that all Christians struggle against and that are a part of the fallen nature of man. And what ha- Does that have anything to do with what Greg was saying? You think, does, does anybody think that the list of sins that people struggle with are not common among both Jews and Gentiles and everyone else? Greg has already told you several times throughout this discussion back and forth, yes, other people are sinners. Yes, everyone else has sinned. That's not the point he's, he's trying to contend with. This is why you'll hear me say so often, what is the point of contention? Because Calvinists, especially James White, are notorious for not talking about the actual point of contention. The point of contention that Steve Gregg is bringing up is what is, Paul in, in, what is Paul's intention in verse 18 and following? Is his intention to describe the natural condition of all men from birth? Yes or no? Based upon what he actually says in verse 17, 18, 19, and following, and the fact that they grew darkened and grew hardened and that there are some people who never did reject the truth and grow hardened and gallus proves that that's not the natural condition of all men from birth because he doesn't say it's a natural condition of all men from birth. It says it's the condition of those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness as opposed to those who, suppre- who, who believe and are deemed righteous by God's grace. The righteous live by faith. That's the point of contention. And notice White doesn't get it. He's not even following Steve's argument. What happens is after this universal condemnation of man, the, the Jew says, ah, yes, but I don't do that because I have the law. And he then says, well, the mere possession of the law does not justify you before God. That's what Romans chapter 2 is about. And Romans chapter 3 then wraps all this stuff up. And it presents to us the foundation of justification by faith by saying all men stand before God on the same ground. There is none righteous, no, not even one. Now, if you use what was just said, then you'd have to go back to the text that Paul's quoting from. Well, that's just about one group. Uh, he, you know, this is about his enemies at a certain point in time. But we, we can't, Paul, you can't extend this out to all people. Come on. You can't extend what out to all people? That all are sinners, which we've already conceded, Steve already conceded. Or you can't extend out the concept and idea that God reveals his wrath to all people who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because of a condition from birth. Because that's the point of contention. You notice how white he shifts the goalpost over here to talk about the universality of everyone who sins. When Greg is hitting on the universality of total inability from birth. Do you see the difference? You can hold to total sinfulness of all human the universality of sin on one hand and not hold the total inability on the other. You all know that, right? Steve Gregg holds to the universality of sin. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What he doesn't agree with and what he's contending with is total inability. All people, because they are sinners, are totally unable from birth to respond positively to the well-meant offer of the gospel. That's what he's contending with. White either doesn't understand that or he is purposefully being obtuse. He's purposely diverting the attention away from the point of contention and talking about the universal sinfulness of man as if Greg doesn't believe in the universal sinfulness of man. And that's what's so frustrating. When, When people like us are watching this, we're going, oh, please just talk about the point of contention. And that's, I know that's Greg's frustration because he's trying to get his debate opponent to move along in the process and, and to confess this so he can move on to the next point. And he can't get him to do it. So he's expressing this frustration. And that's why you have the fireworks in the show because Greg's frustrated because White either doesn't understand the point of contention or he's purposefully being obtuse. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. Well, that was just a particular group. But what does the apostle do with these texts? Verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. And so, Okay, so by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Does Greg believe that? Of course so. Of course. But does that mean, therefore, he can't believe and therefore be 
justified by grace? No. <laughs> That's the whole point. No one is righteous, no, not one. And then the very next chapter, he says, Abraham was righteous. Well, Paul, are you contradicting yourself? Or could it be you're talking about the righteousness that's revealed now from heaven in verse 21 now? You're talking about the righteousness which is by the law, which no one can attain. And then he shifts to talk about the righteousness of those who believe. The righteousness which comes by grace to whosoever believes, whether Jew or Gentile. Maybe that's the contrast in Paul's mind, which is why he can call Job righteous and Enoch righteous and Abraham righteous, while at the other hand saying no one is righteous in accordance with the law. And that's the point. And, and again, Calvinists, some, don't seem to even understand this point of contention in order to engage it. And that's frustrating for those of us that would like to see that engaged. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Greg, Romans 3.19 tells us that God has placed all the world, Jews and Gentiles, without distinction, under accountability before him for sin. Every mouth, the text says, has been closed, and only upon making this claim does Paul launch into the gospel of grace through faith in Jesus Christ. To make his point, Paul strung together in Romans 3.10-18 a number of texts from different contexts, all about specific groups of evil men in history, to make a final concluding point, that being the universal sinfulness of man. Was Paul misusing these texts? And if not, please explain his methodology in light of your comments on Romans 1 from yesterday. Okay, I consider that my comments on Romans 1 were simply, I didn't get to take my position very far because we got interrupted, but I was just saying that Romans 1 tells us that there are people who suppress the truth, but he's not telling us there that all people do it. My opinion is that he's trying to make a case against the Jews and trying to point out that the Jews are really the ones who knew God and who suppressed the truth and whom God has given over to reprobation because they knew God and they suppressed the truth about God. Now, I'm not denying that Gentiles also do so. I'm simply trying to follow Paul's argument and say many things may be true that Paul may not be talking about. In chapter 3 of Romans, he does list together a series of verses from Psalms and one from Isaiah, which are talking about how sinful people are. After he lists these verses, he says in verse 19, Now we know that whatever the law says, and he means these verses he's just quoted, it says to those who are under the law, the Jews. So he's telling us, I believe, that these verses are being used by Paul to point out that David and Isaiah are talking about their Jewish countrymen who are in this condition. Now again, I'm not denying that Gentiles are this way too, but Paul's point, I think, is to illustrate that Jewish people are as sinful as Gentile people. That Gentiles are sinful, I think, goes without saying. His Jewish audience knew that. He's trying to convince the Jew that the Jew is just as bad. And Doesn't that make sense? <laughs> Especially given the context of the New Testament and all that Paul's arguing, that the, the Jews don't even think they're sinners. They don't think they need a Savior because they think they're physicians. J Jesus mentions this all the time. I didn't come for those who are well. I came for the sick. What's he pointing out? There are people who think they're well. They don't even think they're sick. you got to get lost before you get saved. And it's exactly what he's pointing out. All you self-righteous people who don't think you're sick, I'm going to try to show you and demonstrate to you that you're just as sick, you're just as lost as the Gentile people. And here's why. And then goes through and explains that to them. Okay? And it makes perfect sense. Notice that Greg is not denying the universal sinfulness of man as White continually seems to imply in his rebuttals. That's not Greg's point. And you've got to follow that in order to understand the point of contention. Better. There's nothing in those quotes that he uses in verses 10 through 18 that would teach the Calvinistic doctrine of total depravity with the exception, perhaps, of the phrase, there's none that seeks after God. However, David is describing there some condition of some people who, he says in the next line, they have gone out of their way. That is, they, they've gone the wrong way. They've turned astray from an earlier position. And so I don't think he's talking about the birth condition of people, but he's just describing the fact that Jews can be just as wicked as Gentiles. And that's where Paul's, I think, trying to argue. Okay, uh, I would just respond by pointing out that uh, Paul himself interprets his own words in saying uh, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He's including in that both Jews and Gentiles. Uh <laughs> Why? We agree all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Greg knows that. He said it three or four times in his response that you just listened to. That's not the point of contention. He's talking about the natural condition from birth that Calvinists believe means you cannot respond positively. You will always suppress the truth and unrighteousness because of the way you're born. That's the point he's pushing back on. He's not pushing back on the fact that we all sin. Okay, And White is not answering that. 
and I'm sure that's frustrating because I know it's frustrating listening to it. Uh, and when he says that uh, every mouth may be closed, all the world may become accountable to God, uh, it, it, is, it is difficult to follow uh, the flow of Paul's thought uh, to say, well, all of this is just about uh, first century Jews or Jews in that particular point in time. There is no question that he does demonstrate the sinfulness. You, you heard him do this with the provisionist perspective. You've heard him do it with the Bible bro down, ourselves. Oh, this just has to do, oh, these guys' interpretation makes it just have to do with those first century Jews and nobody else, no other application in the whole New Testament for anybody else. That That is absurd, absurd, Okay. When you're talking about, uh, that, that would be almost as absurd as saying, oh, look, here's where he talks to Peter about after he denies him three times and he says, feed my sheep. Oh, so look, he's talking to Peter. Peter's his audience. Therefore, there's no application to us whatsoever in that discourse between Jesus and Peter because he's only talking to Peter. Nobody would say that. Just because you know who the audience is doesn't mean that there's not application to us. That's what every biblical exegete is doing is taking how the application of the, you know, the, uh, Israelites in the wilderness applies to us in our context. We're not literally Jews in the wilderness, but there are principles that apply to the 21st century Christian context. And that's what a good biblical exegete is going to do and a preacher is going to do. He's going to apply the actions and the behaviors of God and man and their interaction with each other in that context to our context. That's, that's what biblical exegesis is all about. And so to say that because it's about, and he's addressing the first century Jews in that context um, of being growing hardened and self-righteous in their rebellion, and therefore being given over to the defilement of their minds and their hearts, that therefore there's no application. Of course, what, what, what would be the application to a 21st century Gentile like myself? Well, guess what happens if I ignore the warnings of God? Guess what happens to me if I continually suppress the truth with, for unri in unrighteousness and I trade the truth that I've been given for lies and I start to follow the ways of my flesh and go that direction? What, what's the application of that? That I could grow hardened? That I too could eventually be cut off? That God might use me in my own rebellious actions to bring about his good purpose of redemption? even through my rebellious actions, that God has the sovereign right as the sovereign to do whatever he wants to with me, that like he says in Romans chapter 11, beware, if you do the same things that the that the root did, that the Gentile Jews people did, what do you think he's going to do to you, Gentiles, a wild olive branch? It's a warning, okay? Don't harden your hearts like the Jews did in the wilderness. That's an application for us. But it was only about the Jews in the wilderness. That's all it was ever about. It has no application to us whatsoever. Of course it does, Why? Right? And so dismissing Greg's point as if he thinks there's no application to us today is, is just a absurdity upon absurdity. To the Jews. Uh, but he's writing to the Romans. And it was not the Jewish question that was the only question to deal with in writing to the church, Rome. And so since he himself makes the application that Jews and Gentiles both stand before God, and they stand before God in the exact same plane as condemned sinners. Uh, the idea that there, there is, are people who are not described uh, by the universal sinfulness of man in those texts, uh, I, I think, falls uh, without support. While it's true that all have sinned, both Jew and Gentiles, the universality of sin we've already established, you, if you don't see the distinction in Scripture between the Jewish people, generally speaking, and the Gentile people, generally speaking, then you're blind to the text. Because how many times does Paul contrast the self-righteous Jew who has closed their eyes and grown calloused with the Gentile who will listen? Think about how many times we've quoted Acts chapter 28 when he witnesses to them all day long trying to persuade them. And some are convinced, but some wouldn't believe. And then he speaks a rebuke over them saying that they're ever seeing, never perceiving because they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see, hear, understand, and turn. And I would heal them. Therefore, I take the message to the Gentiles because they will listen he contrasts the Jewish people with the Gentile people, not because one of them is more moral than the other or one of them is less sinful than the other. Obviously, both Jews and Gentiles are grossly immoral, sinners, Gentiles more so even than the Jews. What's his contrast? What's he saying? He's saying the Gentile people, generally speaking, are more receptive to the gospel because they're not self-righteous sticks in the mud who are on old wineskin that can't take the new wine. And if you can't see that dichotomy in the first century, you're not looking. You're, you're not trying to see it. 
Okay, my turn. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I certainly would not suggest that there are people who have not sinned. And I believe that when Paul says all have sinned, he means all people, Jews and Gentiles, certainly have sinned. Is that the a point question? I would make? Uh, I'm, that I'm, I'm moving toward the question here. I want to continue talking about this same passage. I think you often use verse 11 of Romans 3, that there's none who seeks after God, there's none who understands. And this is, I think, one of your main ways of arguing that the unbeliever cannot seek after God. But I believe that the passage is using hyperbole. I think you disagree with me on that. But in the same psalm, the writer talks about people who are righteous and would no doubt include himself among the righteous. So it seems clear that he's not speaking absolutely. In fact, he does use other hyperbole. He says, the wicked eat up my people like bread. That's certainly a hyperbole. I think the psalm is full of hyperbole. But in saying that there's none who understands, none seeks after God, he certainly acknowledges that there are exceptions. Okay, so I, I just want to comment on that because we've, we've talked about that before. Um, and it is true that Psalm 14, where he's quoting from, refers to the generation of the righteous. Um, put that up on the screen just so that you can see it. Um, it's good. So he's starting to talk about, first, the fool says in his heart there is no God. So who is he talking about? Talking about those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. These are the people who say there is no God, despite all the natural revelation and the special revelation that's out there for them, it's a fool that says there is no God in sight of all of that revelation. It's not saying everybody says there is no God from birth. It, it's saying that this is true of those who, who claim there is no God. And if you keep on reading, he talks about how wicked they are and they eat up my people as bread. Uh, you know, the asp is under their lips and things like that are said in other passages. Um, but but notice he, he, he talks here. Um, I'm trying to see where it said, uh, I had it marked earlier and it came loose. Um, Upon the sons of men who see that they understand, who seek after God, they have turned aside. All the workers are due, do not know. They eat up my people as bread. They do not call upon the Lord. There's a great dread. God, but God, but God is with who? The righteous live by faith. He's with the what? Righteous generation, right? So he's just contrasting those who say, the fool who says there is no God with the righteous generation. So, even in Paul's own quote where he's quoting from, there's the dichotomy between what? The righteous who live by faith and the fool that says there is no God. That's the contrast, even in the verses that he's quoting from. Okay, So now let me ask this question. Are these people in this righteous generation, are they sinless? They never broke a law, right? Of course not. These people are sinful. So why would anybody call them choice? Why would anyone call them righteous? Why would anyone call them good if they're sinners that have fallen short? Uh, maybe because they've believed in the righteous one and they are credited with the righteousness of the only one who is truly righteous, Christ. That's the point that Paul is making. That's the point we're making. And Calvinist, at least some, like James White, don't seem to understand that point well enough to actually engage it, and that's part of the frustration. Well, I, again, I would uh, simply point out what the, what the uh, apostle's own purpose is, and I, I think that is what I would direct the listeners to as well, to go back and ask the question, what is the apostle's purpose? What is his own interpretation of his own words? And what would the original audience... Now, when I try to point out his, the, uh, the, the apostle's own interpretation of his own words in the, at the end of Romans chapter 9, what was the accusation James White made towards me? Oh, he's starting with the end and reading it back into the text. What, what did James White say when we looked at verse 45 in order to better understand verse 44 in John chapter 6? Oh, you're reading something later in the text, back into the text. You're not following the flow of the text. So what is James White doing here? He's saying, okay, go look at the universal sinfulness statement of Romans chapter 3 and use that to read back into Romans chapter 1, total inability. Okay, uh, explain to us how that works because Steve Gregg agrees with the total universal sinfulness of all men and he doesn't contend with that. And so how does Romans chapter 3's statement of the universal sinfulness of men help us to understand how total inability is true in Romans chapter 1? Anyone explain that? No, because it's not a rational conclusion. It's not drawn from the text. 
it's it's the epitome of eisegesis of these uh, letters have understood when paul begins this long catena of passages in 310 through 18 uh what is he going toward what is what is his intention yes he has just discussed the privileges of the of the jews and the and things like that but then he's demonstrating the faithfulness of god and to get into the gospel he then introduces these texts now uh it seems like what we were just told is well okay you need to go back to the individual context of each one of these texts and then limit its application to that original context is that what the apostle did or did the apostle in verse 19 interpret his own collection of these texts which is this really going back to exactly the question that i asked was paul misusing these texts because his own conclusion is that all the world may be held accountable before god that every mouth may be stopped now if there are if there are righteous people who are righteous outside of the special work of the spirit of god in making them righteous and they don't fit in here then where are they discussed the righteous live by faith verse 17 that's where they're discussed verse 21 there's now a righteousness being revealed from heaven which is by grace through faith that's when it's discussed anytime it talks about abraham being credited as righteous that's when they're talking about and guess what that's for both jew and gentile just like all are sinners whether jew or gentile when they sin so too all are declared righteous by grace through faith whether jew or gentile and it seems to me what calvinists are concluding is that paul is trying to say no one is righteous no not one and by the way believing in jesus would be a righteous thing therefore you can't do that that seems to be the flow in the Calvinist mindset is, oh, look, everyone's righteous, both Jew and Gentile, universal sinfulness of everyone. And believing in Jesus, that would be a righteous thing. And since no one's righteous and believing in Jesus is a righteous thing, they must not be able to do that. So God has to unilaterally pick them and cause them to do that. Okay, where does, the, where does Paul ever draw that conclusion? Where is that ever taught in Scripture? It's not. It's just something being read into that text and drawn from that text. It's, it's what you call a non sequitur. It does not flow from what's stated. It's not an argument that flows from what's actually stated, which is why we, we have to point these things out. And why does Paul make the wrong application in stating that all the world becomes accountable before God in light of what has been stated in these verses? Yes, I do believe that there is none who seeks for God. I believe that men seek after all sorts of things other than God, uh, they seek after all uh, sorts of, of benefits of God without God. I do not believe, however, that any man, when seeing the holiness of God, goes toward that holiness unless they have been changed by the work of the Spirit of God within them in regeneration. Okay, there finally it gets to the point of contention where somebody has to what be regenerated before they won't suppress the truth and unrighteousness. In other words, their natural condition is suppressing the truth and unrighteousness from birth because that's their inability based upon a faulty reading of Romans chapter 1. And they have to be regenerated in order to do something other than suppress the truth and unrighteousness because that's just the way they're born. And that's why we're pushing them to go back to the text, show us where does it say every man will always suppress the truth and unrighteousness unless they're regenerated first. And again, there's, there's no text that even comes close to saying that. Okay, uh, well, you know, that's interesting, um, because I believe that I'm following Paul's thought here, too. So we, we really just uh, are disagreeing about how Paul is using the passage. I don't think Paul uses the passage differently than the psalmist meant it. But, and I certainly didn't say that there's a group of people somewhere who are righteous apart from God, uh, as you suggested my view might be. I'm simply raising the question of whether there's people who seek God. Uh, there might be people who are not righteous, but who are seeking God and who might find him. Paul said that God set things up that people might grope after God and find him because he's not far from any of us. And I think that there are people who seek after God even prior to being regenerated. That would be my understanding anyway. Okay, so I, I just wanted you to hear that at least that f portion of the discord. And, and I think he, Steve did a great job of representing what we as provisionists would, would believe and teach. And even if you took another approach of saying, well, no one seeks God on their own, but that doesn't mean you can't respond positively to a God who seeks us. Be another way of explaining that is just to say, no one seeks God in such a way that they would earn their righteousness. Um, that would be another way of, of looking at it, of saying no, no one seeks God in such a way that they actually uh, uh, earn anything, okay? 
Um, in fact, our, our tendency is to seek our own selfish gain. Our tendency is as sinners to, uh, to, to go our own way instead of go to the way of the Lord. All of that's true. We all agree with that. But does it mean when we're confronted by God himself who comes to seek and save the lost through the incarnation, through the inspiration of scripture, uh, through his bride, uh, through the proclamation of the word, all the, the Holy Spirit which brings con conviction to the world of sin, um, all the means by which God makes himself known, when we're confronted as lost men by the intervention of God, can we reply or respond positively to his appeals? So it's not about really whether we seek him or not on our own, because if we're out on our own, I, I'm not trying to claim that people would just naturally seek after God um, and, and just automatically go try to find God or understand who he is if they're all totally left to themselves, which is one of the reasons I think the incarnation was so necessary. He had to come to us. He revealed himself to us. He, he seeks to save the lost. So he's the initiator. And the question is more about what, what we as sinners can do in response to his initiative work of the gospel and bringing light and revelation. So even kind of two defeaters you can take with the no one seeks God argument of, of Romans chapter three. Um, and either one of those defeaters, I think, is, is a much better alternative than the concept and idea of total moral inability unless you're unconditionally elected and effectually regenerated, causing you to seek God and believe in him uh, by effectual means. I, I think that's the, the lowest on the totem pole of possibilities based upon uh, the reading of the entire context. And so, again, just wanted to, to, to kind of highlight that, that passage. We're at the hour mark already, and I don't want this to be too long because I know some people see a hour or two hour or three hour discussion and they turn it off because it's just too long. They just, you know, they don't want to, they don't want to engage in it. But, um, but I, I want pe more people to engage. In this. this is one of the reasons I think that a lot of people didn't watch uh, into parts four and five of that debate with James White, because you can kind of get, you know, you start w listening to something for a while and you can even see the video count, the view count of his videos. The first one or two have a really pretty high video count. And then it, it kind of drops off after that. And some of the, the richest meat, which is why I picked this particular one to, to bring up because it was sections from four and five. Uh, I wanted to, to bring in because I, I knew that most people probably hadn't heard that exchange and i wanted you to hear it because steve gregg who is being represented as the arminian is actually doing a very fine job of representing provisionists with regard to total uh, the concept of total inability and uh and the sufficiency of, of god's revelation his grace in light of the gospel so uh, i wanted to point that out by the way john lennox uh, in his book uh, destined to believe i believe it's called or determined to believe or something of that nature um also takes the provisionist approach to depravity um, and sinfulness, not the typical Arminian approach, uh, uh, the provenient working of grace where there's a, either an ontological change of nature, some, some Arminians have pushed back on that language. I, I don't know, if you believe in total inability, I don't know how else you would describe the change that has to take place than to call it an ontological change because by definition, if someone is unable to believe a truth, what kind of change would be necessary for them to be able to believe truth? So if you're born unable to believe truth, this particular truth at least, uh, unless this thing happens, whatever it is, X, uh, what is that X if not an ontological change? Because look up what ontological change means. It's by definition that very thing. You're not changing your human nature. That's like it doesn't stop being human. You're still human. You have a human nature on both sides of that. What's changing then if not an ontological change? Is it a character change, a moral change? What I mean, I, I don't know what else to call it except an ontological change of nature. And some of my Armenian friends say, you know, you know like Roger Olson says, it is a, a partial regeneration. It is an ontological change. The cl classical Armenians, uh, Arminius himself would have said just it's an ontological change of nature, uh, kind of a, a pre-partial faith regeneration kind of a thing. Um, and the newer Arminians, uh, the Society of Evangelical Arminians and others, they, they say, no, it's not an ontological change of nature. And so you say, okay, well, what, what is it? And then it's like nebulous. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a convincing, it's a, it's a drawing, it's a wooing. Okay. Well, we believe God attempts to convince and persuade and woo, but he does all that through the means that the Bible talks about. Where does it talk about some other means that he does? 
and what is he doing exactly? And, and if you believe in total inability, what, what's fixing the total inability? Is it, is it that they need more light, more revelation? Because we would agree with that. Is it the, how they believe and one they have not heard. They need light. They need revelation. But what the, some Arminians seem to suggest is that there's not only a light problem, a lacking of light, there's also a sight problem. They can't see unless there's this change. And total inability has to be overcome. Well, if you don't accept total inability, like Steve Gregg doesn't seem to want to accept here in this discussion, you don't have this problem anymore. You don't, you don't have to have X, whatever it is, prevenient grace defined however it is by this particular Arminian. You don't need it to overcome TI, total inability, unless you accept that total inability is actually biblical. And that's where I keep pushing my Arminian friends is just to say you've got to establish total inability, which is first taught, as far as I can tell, in Augustine's writings. Um, and even our Arminians are pretty clear to say Augustine got some things pretty wrong. And and so why, why do we just automatically accept this total inability concept if we can't find it, you know, very clearly taught in the Bible? And that, that's the kinds of things I'd like to discuss with some of my Arminian friends who insist on kind of adopting that total inability way of thinking because of a fear of being called a Pelagian or for tactical reasons some of them may have, um, or I, I don't know, there, there may be other, I'm, I'm not starting to psychologize my Arminian friends, there may be good, really good biblical reasons that they want to hold to the concept of total inability, but uh, when there's so many good Arminian types out there, like the John Lennox's and Steve Gregg's of the world showing you, and, and even David Pullman's of the world, uh, even though he only works at Dillard's and therefore we should never listen to what he has to say. David Pullman has done a really good job explaining how John 6 and uh, the passage about Lydia and these kinds of things aren't really talking about the Arminian prevenient grace concepts. Um, and so I, I'm just saying, where, where does the Arminian have to go if you... If you remove the dead means moral inability concept, which is the Calvinist kind of go-to, dead means dead. And a lot of Arminians don't believe that dead means dead in the Calvinistic sense. If you take all those passages and proof texts away because you don't take it the Calvinistic way of total inability, then why are you still holding on to the concept of total inability? And that's that's why we're we're pushing back on it. In love, and I have a lot of respect for the guys I'm debating on that point. And it seems like you you, you feel like you may be kind of get into the weeds or maybe being a little too nuanced when we get into our discussions with our Armenian friends, because for all practical purposes, we, we do hold to a lot in common. But there, there is some uh, points that I think are, are worthy of discussion in that, in that, uh, that difference. Yeah. Um, so hopefully that, that is helpful. So with that said, go now, share Christ and show love. God bless. See you next time. <laughs>